Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, a further uh, a meeting uh, in the course of advanced uh, critical semiotics devoted to in the semiotics of um, um, ideologies and the concept of ideology in cultural semiotics, critical semiotics, and the reflection on meaning and language. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I hope you can see me well. If it's uh, not the case, please let me know. It's always a pleasure meeting you on this platform. And um, it is also um, interesting that uh, we are uh, carrying on this seminar in these uh, specific conditions uh, online and not in presence, because that gives us an opportunity also to reflect on the ways in which um, digital technology and digital communication is uh, impacting on uh, in our life and also the production of meaning, the semi-sphere, as Lotman would uh, call it. So, um, today let me give a short summary of the path that we have uh, been taking together because we are now beyond the first half of our seminar. So we have started from some very simple, but at the same time, very difficult questions. Um, when we use expressions like, it makes sense, it does not make sense, which is a typical English expression. Uh, in English people say, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, no, it does not make sense. Um, but what is it actually that makes that sense? In English, in the subject of this a preposition, it makes sense, is an impersonal. It's a it. It makes sense. Something makes sense. So, uh, it is a, an agency concerning the uh, making of sense, the making of meaning, that is uh, attributed to something which is actually impersonal. So, uh, it is not simply a person who makes sense. It is not simply an object that makes sense. Uh, there is something more about this it. So what is it in this it that makes sense? This is a question that we are trying to face. It's an abstract philosophical question. But at the same time, it is fundamental to understand uh, the sense, the meaning, um, of certain prepositions like it is meaningful or it is meaningless. What is it that we actually grasp with these expressions? Um, what is it about the absence or the presence of meaning? So, um, as we have underlined many times, uh, when individuals or whole societies uh, find meaning through language in reality, they are guided by invisible schemes called language ideologies. Uh, we have talked about ideologies, language ideologies, semiotic ideologies, also together with our distinguished guests. So, uh, as I've underlined throughout this seminar, language ideologies have been variously defined, but a common description and one of the last definitions designates them as uh, probably remember, sets of ideas a community holds about the role of language. So, uh, language ideologies have become a key object of investigation for uh, linguistic anthropology, that is the branch of ethnology, of anthropology, that concentrates on the role of language in human uh, communities. Language, however, uh, as you remember, we're still going through this short summary in order to then proceed toward uh, new contents. Language is not only verbal, it does not manifest itself only through words, but also through other patterned articulations involving mental representations and non-verbal systems of science. The transition from linguistics to semiotics um, it, is, uh, it is a transition that uh, is needed exactly in order to pass from a definition of language as pure verbal uh, system to a definition of language as a more all-encompassing 
a faculty of human beings, the faculty of patterning reality and attributing meaning to it. So, language does not manifest itself only through words, and that is why linguistic anthropology must give rise to a semiotic anthropology in order to fully grasp the place of language in human groups. What is the meaning of language? What is the purpose of language? How can we define it? Um, so, one way of defining the place of language in society entails expanding the study of language ideologies into that of semiotic ideologies. Uh, semiotic ideologies uh, this is a new concept that is introduced in this course um, of critical semiotics. Uh, semiotic ideologies can be defined as implicit guidelines that pattern meaning-making in societies. When something makes sense, when meaning emerges in society, actually this meaning does it according to certain guidelines that contribute to the emerging of these patterns and that uh, are exactly what we mean by uh, semiotic ideologies. So, uh, we are going through the seminar chapter by chapter, event after event, lesson after lesson, through a series of elements that are impacted by, that are affected by this a patterning a activity of a, um, semiotic ideologies. So, uh, language is used to give value to space and time, to perceive reality, to interpret it, to keep memory of it. All these activities seem spontaneous, exactly like speaking one's mother tongue, you know, when I speak Italian, or when you speak Chinese or the other languages that are your native languages, you don't actually think about it anymore because you have interiorized these languages which are part of your physiology. They are part of this physiology of your brain. And as I said to you when I was explaining the concept of a second nature, you know, once you learn a new foreign language, you cannot unlearn it. You can perhaps uh, forget about it, uh, forget it, but that uh, impact that learning a new language has on the neurophysiology of your brain, the constitution of new synapses, of new, uh, let's say, neuronal uh, connections, will stay with you forever. And uh, this is even uh, more central when a native language is acquired. A native language is acquired usually in the first years of life, you know, up to like age 10 or 11. And it is that moment in which brain plasticity is at its peak and uh, being surrounded by speakers of a certain language uh, contribute to shape in a permanent way um, the linguistic function and, uh, and the knowledge of a certain language in a young brain. So, uh, this said, uh, Exactly like natural languages, uh, nonverbal meaning making too follows some rules which together compose uh, what we have called on several occasions this mysterious grammar of signification. What we are looking for, what we are after, is exactly this mysterious grammar of signification. So, building on linguistic anthropology, semiotics, semiotic anthropology, we are trying to understand why we human beings conceive of verbal and nonverbal meaning as we do, and how different cultures, the Chinese cultures, the Italian culture, the Chinese culture of 1000 years ago, the Chinese culture of today, develop alternative different understandings of meaningfulness and meaninglessness through both verbal language and other systems of science. So, if you remember in the introduction, we have spelled out the overall uh, rationality of the course, we have provided the roadmap to it, and we have described the main content of in the subsequent lessons. 
Um, we have also laid down the big questions to which the course um, uh, sets about to answer. Um, we have also surveyed the existing literature on the concept of language ideology. Other uh, professors who intervene in the course, like Professor Jimmy Ponzo, also uh, reminded uh, you and us the uh, most important steps uh, in the philosophical reflection about the concept itself of ideology. And we have uh, found out that the now scholars agree uh, on defining ideologies as a set uh, of ideas that a community holds about the role of the language. Uh, scholars, all, uh, 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 scholars, however, we have also underlined, uh, disagree as regards whether these ideas that shape meaning in society are uh, implicit or explicit. And so we have uh, uh, expanded on alternative views uh, on this matter, which also imply different methodologies. The analysis of explicit considerations on language, in the former case, and the analysis of more, let's say, various multifarious materials uh, in the second and the latter case. So, subsequently, uh, we have expanded on the methodological challenge of gathering evidence on such abstract and omnipresent phenomena as semiotic ideologies, and we have pointed out that the current expansion of the semiotic focus from science and texts to whole cultures needs actually the development of a coherent method. Therefore, we have proposed to establish this method through uh, the application of a specific theory, which is the topological theory of Yuri Lotman and uh, the concept of fractal. You remember a text as a fractal structure in relation to a semisphere, to the analysis of different kinds of symmetries and asymmetries in the semisphere. Um, then we have started progressing in our course, taking into account some uh, elements which are uh, absolutely central, fundamental in the activity of meaning making. So uh, we have talked about agency, for instance, you remember our lesson on agency, on the fact that uh, in, it is important in semiotic anthropology dealing with the origins of textual agency, but also with origins of textual inertia. You know, how is it that a text, uh, a language artifact, exerts certain influence on us, pushes us to believe certain things, to feel certain things, to act in a certain way? And how is it that, on the contrary, other texts appear as inertial? They do not have the same capacity, the same ability to um, uh, push us toward a certain emotion, a certain cognition, a certain action. So, um, we have pointed out, uh, referring to the semiotics of Charles Sanders Pierce, that texts predominantly work as either indexes, icons, or symbols, and that these three types of uh, texts um, exert agency to an increasing extent. So we have found out that uh, the indexicality is a key element in the way in which a text motivates itself, motivates its meaning, and at the same time pushes people to believe, to feel, to act. So um, we have tried to um, determine the origin of this gradient, of this increasing power of text in the uh, dialectics between motivation and arbitrariness. You know, the more a text is received as motivated and the likelier it is that it will exert a strong agency. On the contrary, the more a text is seen as arbitrary, as a pure arbitrary creation, as the product, the fruit, of a purely arbitrary creation, and the less it will be able to exert this very compelling agency. So, this hypothesis about a dialectics between arbitrariness and motivation, between indexicality and non-indexicality, leads to a sort of an articulation of the rhetoric of motivation and demotivation. So, on the one hand, uh, cultures 
seek to motivate certain texts, to present certain texts which are absolutely central for uh, such a culture as if they were almost a natural product. You know, think about um, sacred texts or texts that are considered sacred in certain societies. Think about the Bible in Christianity or in Judaism and think about the Quran in Islam. You know, for someone who is a uh, believer, who is a, uh, let's say, uh, faithful and uh, um, convinced member of a religious community, that text will not be a text whatsoever, will not be like any other text. It will be the text, the only text that actually uh, somehow regulates the relation between immanence and transcendence, between the community of believers and, uh, this, let's say, this deity, this divine power. So, for a believer, the Quran in Islam, the Bible in Christianity, uh, the Bible or Torah in Judaism, uh, is not like a novel, a novel that can be read, can be appreciated, it cannot be appreciated, it can be replaced by another novel written by a different author in a different language and so on and so forth. It's not the case. That text, the sacred text for the religious community will be absolutely uh, impossible to replace. It will be a unique text. So, it is a unique text because it is seen as motivated. It is not seen as arbitrary. It is seen as a necessary text and not as a text that somehow refers to um, a human creation. So, uh, we have uh, in a specific lesson talked about the strategies, um, the rhetorical strategies of motivation and demotivation uh, through which communities of interpreters, uh, let's say, promote or demote the um, uh, possibility uh, of text, of a, uh, exerting this agentive force, uh, the force of a text, the powerfulness of a text depends also on the belief of its degree of arbitrariness or motivation. And this is uh, not something that happens only to verbal text, but it is something that happens to many cultural configurations. You know, think about uh, something I'm uh, working on at, at the moment, you know, this afternoon, here it's uh, 8.28 a.m. in Germany, this afternoon, uh, when you will be probably all sleeping uh, at 5 p.m., I will give a lecture for a congress in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And there, I'm going to talk about frontiers and the semiotics of frontiers. Now, there are different ways of seeing frontiers. But there is a big difference between, let's say, the nationalist discourse that believes that frontiers are actually motivated, they are not arbitrary. Frontiers are as they are because there is a deep motivation that uh, is behind them in the history of the nation, in the history of the culture and language of that nation. It is a history many times connected with wars, with conflicts, with struggles uh, with other countries and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you might believe that these frontiers are actually not motivated but are arbitrary. You know, this is the case of many, let's say, post-colonial states. So think about the frontiers of Nigeria in Africa, for instance, or the frontiers of a, um, countries in the Middle East. Uh, these frontiers, in many circumstances, were not uh, supported by a rhetoric of motivation like national frontiers in Europe, which were created and took shape during the, let's say, rise of the nationalists in, in Europe. But they were drawn on a map by colonial powers, so as a consequence, uh, uh, they look like straight lines that divide the African territory and uh, uh, in many cases they are seen as completely arbitrary, not motivated by the citizens of these territories, by the members of this community. 
which give much more importance to other borders, to other frontiers, not those that are visible on the cartography, on the map of these countries, but frontiers in terms of who speaks what language, uh, who believes in what religion, who belongs to what ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So, so-called civil wars in post-colonial countries, in many circumstances, uh, take place exactly because there is a complete mismatch between the state um, uh, frontiers and internal borders uh, uh, dividing different human groups, uh, social cultural groups uh, within, uh, in the frame of this, uh, let's say, arbitrary uh, uh, state space. So, this is to say that the dialectics between uh, arbitrariness and motivation is a dialectics that concerns not only verbal text, not only fictional texts, not only in, uh, novels or sacred texts, but in general it is a dialectics that uh, underpins, that uh, a, a underlays uh, every meaning production, every meaning making in society. So, uh, subsequently, uh, we have um, transitioned from uh, talking about uh, the agency of texts and the agency of motivation and arbitrariness in cultures to the place of time in the semiosphere. And in particular, we have dwelled on the semiotic ideologies of time. You know, we have suggested that cultures can be categorized depending on whether they concentrate their attention on the past, the present, or the future, and depending on whether this attention is euphoric, dysphoric, or neutral. You know, what, what kind of uh, semiotic ideology of a time are we living through right now? Well, um, you see, uh, many individuals nowadays, but also many communities, many states, many countries, are extremely nervous, extremely anxious, because uh, given this uh, pandemic situation, it is very difficult to plan, it is very difficult to project oneself into the future, it is very difficult for a university, for instance, to organize a big congress, because uh, uh, we don't know exactly what the evolution of the pandemic will be, what the spreading of the virus in society will be. So, as a consequence, even societies or individuals that were a, uh, customarily, that were normally uh, projected into the future, that would endorse somehow a semiotic ideology of time, um, underlining the value of the future as compared to the present or the past. This is very typical of fast expanding, you know, progressing societies, even those uh, individuals and societies then must now somehow reconsider the value of the future. They must reconsider the importance that they would give to the future in their semiotic ideology. We have understood, for instance, even the, um, let's say, most enthusiastic a supporters of the value of the future among us, we have understood that uh, the future is always fragile, that uh, unknown elements can appear, can intervene at any time and disrupt our plans. So, uh, the semiotic ideology of time is now changing in many countries, in many societies, as a consequence also of this pandemic. Many societies that were projected into the future, including the Chinese society that was evolving at a very uh, fast pace towards a better and better, at least from the economic point of view, future, they are reconsidering this ideology. And in certain cases, uh, uh, a sort of dystopic ideology of future times is gaining momentum, you know, apocalyptic visions of the future, dystopic visions of the future are becoming quite prominent in societies nowadays, 
uh, starting from the creations of artists, of novelists, of filmmakers that are more and more seeing the future as a dystopic one, as a bleak, as a grey one in which uh, human beings will actually have to live together with this pandemic for a very long time. And hopefully it will not be so, but you know, we're not interested in the evolution of this situation as scientists, as virologists, as epidemiologists. We are interested uh, in the way in which the presence of this big health problem uh, a global uh, epidemic is changing the way in which the global culture but also local cultures function. It is changing the kind of texts that are circulated in these uh, uh, spheres. So, we have talked about uh, this specific topic, the semiotic ideologies of a time. Uh, we have underlined the fact that in circumstances like the present one, where it is not possible anymore to plan a happy future or to firmly believe in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, constant uh, progression of humanity uh, toward better and better conditions, then um, either people start developing and communities and cultures start developing dystopic visions of the future, as I said, or they uh, start concentrating on the present. So many people uh, in uh, uh, many countries nowadays, for instance, are reconsidering the value of the present in relation to the future. They are thinking, well, you know, in the past I was postponing so many things, I was uh, jeopardizing, um, for instance, family relations or friends because I was planning my professional future. But now I'm understanding that this is very fragile, that I should concentrate on the present and on what I have and people who surround me. And, you know, uh, some people are uh, escaping the bleak future by reconsidering the present. Some other people develop a nostalgic a, attitude toward time and they, for instance, uh, uh, get trapped in the nostalgic memory or when things were different, or when they were able to travel, they were able to meet their friends, they were able to party, to go to restaurants, and so on and so forth. So there are different reactions. And we have um, underlined, we have emphasized the importance of a, uh, developing a complex understanding of these semiotic ideologies. So, um, we have also introduced the concept of a aspectuality. You remember the difference between temporality and aspectuality. So uh, the articulation between, let's say, semiotic ideologies uh, valuing the past, the present, or the future um, is further complexified with reference to this linguistic concept, which becomes also a semiotic concept, and the um, uh, semiotic dimensions of indexical reference to the ontology of time. You remember time as a physical dimension, as something that we can measure, as something that actually is a, um, uh, articulated by uh, uh, generally a, a shared um, linguistic structures uh, uh, like calendars or agendas or uh, time zones and so on and so forth. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, in reflecting about the semiotic ideologies of time, we shouldn't consider only this indexical reference to the ontology of time, so time as a physical dimension, something that we can measure, but also its iconic representation and the symbolical evocation evocation of time. So, we have to consider time from an indexical point of view, time from an iconic, iconic point of view, and time from a symbolical point of view. Now, um, we have uh, also emphasized that cultures, uh, semiotic ideologies, do not diverge only in terms of when in time they focus their attention on, but also in terms of how in time they do so according to the specific quality they attribute to the temporal dimension. You know, for instance, um, at the moment 
I believe that uh, what a, a semiotic ideologies of time are emphasizing is uh, what uh, the linguistics of aspectuality calls the uh, uh, terminativity. So uh, everyone is very concentrated on when exactly and how exactly this pandemic will finish. Uh, we're not interested anymore in how it started. We are not interested anymore, uh, or uh, we are not interested predominantly in how it has developed, but do we want to know when it is going to be over, when vaccinations will be available, and so on and so forth. So, um, after talking about time, we have um, started inquiring about space, and we have concentrated in particular on invisible frontiers. And remember, what I was saying about arbitrariness and motivation of geopolitical frontiers, but looking at the map of many contemporary um, geopolitical spaces, including cities, you know, Western cities, for example, using a, some a digital maps, Google Maps in the West or Tencent Maps in China. Uh, well, we realize that uh, there are no fences, no barriers, no borders, no walls, no frontiers, and yet uh, cities are constantly characterized by urban frontiers that are not visible, but divide ethnic groups, socio-economic classes, and of course also cultural communities. So, these frontiers are not virtual, you know, they bring about, for instance, also the physical separation of different groups of people as effectively as the visible frontiers do, and they are not neutral either, you know, more often than not, they express the weakness of social cohesion uh, within contemporary cities. You know, there is a, a big problem of a religious extremism in, extremism in, in many Western countries, and particularly in some big metropolises of continental Europe, like Paris or Brussels or Brussels, and um, in these cities, you cannot see any frontiers on the map, any uh, geopolitical frontiers, any administrative frontiers. But it is more and more evident that certain communities living in certain areas of these cities, of these Western European cities, Paris, Brussels, they're living according to different rules. They're living according to different sense of time, space, community, relations, and law as well, which creates a lot of conflict with a, the overall administration of the city itself. So, a thorough analysis of these invisible frontiers and a, also a competent elaboration of ways that they could be bridged is, um, are both therefore very urgent. So, uh, how is it possible to study something that is invisible? So, if the city is characterized by invisible frontiers, how can I study them? Well, I can study what is invisible through the science that this uh, invisible reality uh, distributes and uh, uh, through which manifests itself, it manifests itself in the city. That's why semiotics, critical semiotics is so important, because it allows me, through the uh, harvesting and collection of this science, um, uh, to have a better picture and better understanding of uh, social and social cultural dynamics in the city that would be otherwise invisible. And um, if you remember, uh, and with this I will conclude <laughs> this, uh, uh, let's say, summary of the path that we have uh, gone through uh, in the last uh, weeks. Uh, I'm doing so because we are more or less beyond halfway through this course in, uh, in critical semiotics. We have talked about perception, you know, we have talked about the illusion that our perception might be a natural a, a activity, and uh, we have introduced some examples, you remember deja vus or hallucinations, 
in order to underline the fact that our perception is always a construction and this construction does not depend solely on the neurophysiology of our brain, on our cognition, but also on the specific social cultural context in which the perception takes place. Being the member of a certain culture pushes us also to a perceived reality in a certain way, giving more importance to certain elements of reality um, rather than uh, other elements of uh, reality. And uh, also, the semiotic ideologies of language have a tremendous impact on our perceptions. You know, even the language that we speak, uh, in a way, affects uh, the modalities through which we perceive reality. You know, if we speak a language in which the subject is always very important, and we always see uh, the subject as a primary element which then accomplishes an action that then affects another sub subject or another object of the world. If we have this linguistic structure in mind, if we uh, use language according to this um, language ideology, then a reality, the reality surrounding us, will be seen also according to this scheme. So, um, you probably uh, heard about conspiracy theories. What are, what are conspiracy theories? Well, conspiracy theories, for instance, are those theories according to which uh, certain events in the world, usually some dramatic events, catastrophes, natural disasters, but also the spreading of a pandemic, or a socio, a, a socio-economic catastrophes, you know, the break down of a, uh, the collapsing of a financial market, you know, the collapse, collapse of the financial market in the West in 2008, are actually plotted. They are the product of a conspiracy. So why do people believe in conspiracy theories? Why do they tend to explain these dramatic phenomena like the pandemic, like um, the collapse of a financial market, like the spreading of a disease and so on and so forth, why do they tend to explain them uh, by referring them to conspiracies, which in most cases do not actually exist. They are the pure product of people's imagination. There, there is at least no evidence that supports this belief is belief in conspiracy theories. Well, people, uh, as it has been found out by research, recent research in this field, uh, people tend to believe in conspiracy theories because they cannot actually accept the fact that things, and especially dramas, especially catastrophes, especially tragedies, happen in reality or happen in the world without the agency of a personal subjective agent that causes actually these catastrophes. So, uh, whenever something happens in the world, especially when these uh, major uh, dramatic events take place, uh, the instinct, the narrative instinct, is to refer these events to a subject. Uh, the pandemic is spreading, therefore someone must have started it. A subject, a country, a community, a group. You know, this is uh, not always a scientific way of explaining phenomena. Some phenomena just uh, uh, happen, take place for a multiplicity of causes which cannot be always disentangled, but at the same time it is very important for human beings to come up with a simple picture of what is happening or what has happened. And the simplest picture we can come up with is the picture that attribute these situations to a, an intentionality, to someone who intentionally caused the crack of the financial market, the collapse of the stock exchange market, and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is to say that um, the way in which we perceive uh, 
um, reality, we perceive even the links of causes and effects in reality is deeply affected by the uh, semiotic ideologies that are prevailing in a certain society and also uh, by the semiotic ideologies that are implicitly at work in a certain uh, language. So today we're going to progress a little bit farther, um, dear friends, and um, we're going to start talking about another kind of a semiotic ideology, a semiotic ideology that does not only affect uh, agency, time, space, perception, but a semiotic ideology that uh, has as an object the object of relation. And uh, we uh, started talking about it in, by mentioning conspiracy theories. What are conspiracy theories? Deep down, they uh, can be defined as fallacious wrong attributions of a relations of cause and effect. In conspiracy theories, we see a cause in reality for a certain effect, but actually this cause is a pure product of our imagination. We believe that, uh, you know, that uh, anti-Semitism is a very big problem in the history of um, uh, humanity. Um, it has caused major disasters, uh, including the Shoah, the extermination of Jews, uh, the attempt at exterminating Jews in, in Europe. Well, in Nazi Germany, but also nowadays, uh, there were, there still, unfortunately, are people believe that <clears throat> crisis, financial crisis, are uh, uh, engineered, are uh, caused intentionally by Jewish lobbies, for instance, that control the financial markets of the world. There is absolutely no evidence about this theory. But you see, this theory, which is a conspiracy theory, um, is created exactly by attributing a causal role and an intention to act to a minority, in this case, Jews, um, who, on the contrary, do not have uh, absolutely any role in um, the uh, coming about of uh, the uh, effects that are imputed to them. So, uh, the question that uh, the critical semiotics asks itself is, how can we distinguish between a correct attribution of relation between cause and effect and a wrong attribution of the relation between cause and effect? Uh, you see, we are not talking about this problem from a scientific point of view, because scientists uh, have uh, quite precise methodologies in order to distinguish between, let's say, a truthful cause, the truthful cause of a natural phenomenon and the apparent seeming cause of a natural phenomenon. You know, what uh, scientists usually do is to uh, test their hypothesis about the causes and the effects in reality through experiments, experiments that are repeated again and again in order to corroborate certain hypotheses, to verify certain hypotheses and to falsify other hypotheses, to determine that other hypotheses are not correct. You know, this is the general idea of Popper, who has been a great philosopher and one of the most important thinkers, uh, both as regards to the scientific method and the fight against the conspiracy theories. Um, but in the field of social sciences, we cannot actually experiment we cannot reproduce an experiment. Of course, we can have what Germans call Gedankenexperimente, so a mental experiment. But at the same time, uh, we cannot test society, our hypothesis about society, in the same which, you know, in the same way in which we test our hypothesis about a certain physical phenomenon or a certain a certain uh, chemical phenomenon, or even about a certain biological dynamic. So, the situation is actually even more complicated if we leave social sciences and we inquire about humanities. How can we distinguish between, let's say, a truthful attribution of causality and a wrongful, wrong attribution of causality when 
we interpret a text, how can we um, verify, corroborate, or on the contrary, falsify and discard our hypothesis, not about a scientific experiment, not about a social a situation, a social phenomenon, but about a text, a novel, for instance, or a film. Um, how can we discard a certain ideas, hypotheses that we might have about what the author wanted to say? Because this is also an attribution of a causality. In many circumstances, we watch a movie, we read a novel, we watch a TV series, and we think, oh, this is exactly what the author wanted to say. But that too might be a sort of a small conspiracy theory when we attribute to an author, to the author of a text, uh, an intention that actually he did not have, she did not have. When we see a meaning in a text that was never actually a intentionally a conveyed through that text uh, by a certain author. So, the question is, once again, a question of semiotic ideology of relation. A, according to what general schemes we decide, in a nutshell, uh, what hypothesis of interpretation, what interpretive hypothesis are reasonable and what interpretive hypotheses, on the contrary, are not reasonable. And in order to um, understand um, these dialectics between reasonability and unreasonability, um, we must, first of all, understand the difference between rationality and reasonability. Um, I know that maybe translating these two words into non-Indo-European languages uh, uh, might be difficult, but we'll try to understand through a structural comparison what is the difference between these two terms and these two concepts. On the one hand, the concept of rationality, on the other hand, the concept of reasonability. So, what do we mean? when we say that our interpretation of the world is rational? And what do we mean, on the contrary, when we say that our interpretation of the world is reasonable? What is the difference between these two words and what do they entail in terms of, uh, let's say, circulation of meaning in society? We are actually talking exactly about the first question that we asked in uh, uh, this course, which is the fundamental question of a critical semiotics. It makes sense. What does it mean? What that little word it means? What does it mean when I say that something makes sense? And in order to understand it, we must uh, somehow come up with ideas about how a meaning is made in society through what logics, logics of reasonability on the one hand and logic of rationality on the other hand. Both reasonability and rationality have to do with reason, with a, our ability of reasoning about the world, of coming up with, let's say, motivated ideas about the world and what it means. At the same time, um, there are two different ways of using our human reason to interpret the world and two different attitudes. So now we're going to take a very short a break of 10 minutes. It is now the hour here in uh, Freiburg, Germany. It is 9 o'clock. So we're going to take a short break and then we're going to resume in 10 minutes exactly from uh, where we have stopped. We're going to explain a little bit more about the difference between rationality on the one hand and reasonability on the other hand, in order to better comprehend how uh, we work, how we function as interpretive agents. So, 10 minutes break, please, and we're going to resume exactly at past, in, uh, 10 past. Thank you. 
So, <clears throat> welcome back. Um, I hope you are rested. <laughs> it's a long day for you. Uh, this is the beginning of the day for me. And uh, um, of course, you can interrupt me at any time if there are problems with the connection or simply if you have any comments or, or uh, questions to ask. But we're going to have time also at the end of the um, class today to um, uh, ask questions possibly receive answers. Um, I see also that among us is a professor Simona Stano. Simona Stano is a professor at the University of Turin but also at New York University and she will join us um, today in the third part of the class to uh, give a talk and presentation about a ideology, semiotic ideologies, which is a topic she's investigating and she's writing about. Um, but uh, uh, good morning, Simona. But also in, in relation to what has been the major, the main object of her research so far, which is food, um, which is a, a new, relatively new academic a topic, which is a tremendously interesting and important and um, especially from the point of view of semiotics so, so many things can be understood about culture uh, thinking uh, of food and reflecting on food so uh, i will introduce properly uh, simona stano later on uh, let's continue for the moment from uh, where we have a uh, uh, stopped uh, so the difference between rationality and reasonability well, rationality is a quality that can be uh, found, uh, especially in the way in which uh, scientists in hard sciences, uh, in natural sciences, represent the world, represent reality. So they base, or they should base at least, their representation of reality on scientific hypotheses that then are tested through experiments that uh, are verified through further repeated experiments and are uh, then either uh, corroborated or they are falsified. Uh, of course, a theory, a scientific theory, is never a uh, truthful uh, in an absolute way. It is always truthful in a relative way. It is let's say corroborated, it is a, a proven truthful until um, some new findings, some new experiments, some new theories actually replace the previous one uh, because they can explain a greater number of phenomena because they can explain them in a more accurate way, in a more precise way. This is exactly how uh, the history of um, scientific theories has um, uh, unfolded uh, uh, during the centuries. Um, uh, for centuries, uh, uh, scientists have believed that uh, Isaac Newton's uh, explanation of uh, the physics of reality through the theory of gravity was the best way to understand how uh, the uh, reality would work, how, for instance, the uh, cosmic reality, the astronomic reality would work. But then, at some stage, uh, uh, Einstein came up with uh, a theory that was encompassing Isaac Newton's theory, but at the same time, through the concept of relativity and, and the theory, the physical theory, theory of relativity, could explain also phenomena that could not be explained by the theory of gravity. So, you see, there is a progression which is based once again on hypotheses that then are tested and are proven wrong or, or true. And actually, um, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity was uh, proven uh, truthful also by some astronomic events that were predicted by Albert Einstein's theory. So, uh, this is what we call rationality. Uh, this is what we mean when we uh, say that uh, Einstein's a theory of relativity is a rational theory, or when we mean that uh, Isaac Newton's um, uh, theory of gravity was a rational theory. So, uh, 
uh, rational theories are theories that are based on scientific evidence, uh, which are based on facts, which are based on empirical observation of reality. But of course, um, the scientific domain, uh, the understanding of uh, the reality, the physical reality that surrounds us, uh, is not the only interpretive task for human beings. Uh, human beings do not interpret reality only through physics, but interpret reality also in relation to uh, the mental representations that they have of such reality. And these mental representations fundamentally rely on language. So when we uh, are in the domain of hard sciences, natural sciences, we interpret the reality, but when we are in the domain of social sciences, and even more when we are in the domain of humanities, uh, we interpret reality as it is represented and uh, as it is uh, reflected in language. And that's why, in many circumstances, we cannot say that our interpretations in social sciences or in the humanities are rational, because they don't have the same force, they don't have the same a, uh, a structure that uh, a scientific theories would have. Uh, what we propose in social sciences, and especially in humanities, is a, um, let's say, different uh, formulation of a, the human capacity for reasoning about the world and about language, which goes under the name of reasonability. What is reasonability? Well, when I propose a theory as a rational theory, I'm implicitly meaning that that theory is true. It's true in relation to evidence, in relation to facts, uh, in relation to empirical data. And uh, I'm also implying that there are no uh, alternative in interpretation, there, are no, there is no inter alternative interpretation, there is no alternative theory that can explain the same phenomenon better. But you see, when I propose a reasonable theory, a reasonable interpretation of a text, or a reasonable interpretation of a social phenomenon, I'm actually opening this interpretation to um, the contribution of intersubjectivity. What is intersubjectivity? Well, intersubjectivity is the third way between subjectivity and objectivity. What is subjective? Well, if I go to an art gallery and um, I walk uh, surrounded, I walk in the gallery surrounded by artworks, and subjectively I can say, oh, I like that painting, or I dislike that sculpture, oh, this um, particular uh, installation has enormous interest uh, for today's culture, and so on and so forth. But these are subjective judgments. Um, then I might go to the same art gallery and cast an objective eye on the painting. So, for instance, um, I could say that a certain canvas measure one meter by one meter. And this is something which is not subjective, it is actually objective, meaning that I have a method, I have an instrument, and I have some empirical data, and by applying this method and this instrument, in this case a simple method, to some empirical data, I come with the conclusion that that painting is one meter wide uh, per one meter um, uh, high. So, uh, on the one hand, a completely subjective appreciation of the aesthetics of artworks, uh, on the other hand, a completely objective appraisal of the measurements, for instance, of artworks in the gallery. This two ways at looking at, at the contents of an art gallery are completely different because they look at different aspects of what I see. You know, in the first case is the emotions, the feelings, the ideas that I have when I walk through an art gallery, and in the second case is simply the physical presence of some objects in this art gallery. But at the same time, there is also a third possibility, which is not the uh, subjective uh, evaluation, the subjective judgment, it is not the objective measurement, 
it is something somehow in between. So intersubjectivity takes place when I go to visit uh, this art gallery, I look at the paintings, I look at the sculptures, and I formulate some hypothesis, for instance, about what a, is actually the meaning of a painting, what a particular painting means. And when I do so, in the framework of art history, art theory, semiotics, I don't mean to explain what the painting means to me, subjectively. I don't mean to explain, uh, uh, to uh, express a subjective evaluation, a subjective judgment of the painting. I'm actually proposing an interpretation for other people to embrace it, to adopt it. So I'm not just saying, oh, I like this painting. I'm saying, no, this painting means X and Y, X and Y, and you should probably see the same. This is what intersubjectivity is about. I look at the painting and I say, oh, the painting is beautiful to me, and this is subjective. Or I take the painting and I measure it, and I say, this is one meter by one meter, that is objective. But I can also look at the painting and say, to me, this painting, uh, to my interpretation in this painting, uh, the main topic is the relation between life and death, or the relation between peace and war, or the um, position of um, human beings in relation to nature, and so on and so forth. When I'm doing this, when I'm uh, choosing this third way, on the one hand, I'm not expressing a purely subjective view, because saying, you know, I like this painting, is not the same as saying this painting interprets the condition of human beings after the war. Uh, you see, the second interpretation is more than appreciation. It is an intersubjective proposal. It is something that I say to other people, for instance, people who come with me to the gallery, but also for instance, my readers, if I am an art criticist or an art theoretician, and I am implicitly proposing this interpretation to other people for them to reject my interpretation, to embrace my interpretation, or to modify my interpretation. This is what intersubjectivity is about, is the circulation of meaning in a certain community according to certain rules. Uh, there cannot be any intersubjectivity if there aren't any rules of interpretation, if uh, somehow we are not playing the same game. You know, it would be like going to a sport field and uh, being in a sport field together with other people, but then everyone is playing a different sport. So there is someone who's playing soccer, another one who's playing football, another one who's playing rugby, another one who's playing tennis in the same field. We cannot possibly play together. So in order to play together, we must accept certain rules, you know, like either we accept the rule that the ball must not be touched with your hands, and that is soccer, or we accept the rule that actually the ball can be touched by hand, and this is handball. Uh, but we must, in order to develop a common game, accept some uh, rules, some frame within which we're going to give rise to the game, and uh, we're going to uh, then uh, interpret uh, in different ways um, the um, activity itself of playing. So, I'm introducing the concept of intersubjectivity because this is a fundamental also to understand what reasonability is. You see, when I um, say that my painting is one meter by one meter, uh, I'm not saying something reasonable, I'm, say I'm saying something rational. So, because I've actually adopted a common, a universally accepted standard, which is the meter, or the yard, or anyway, a standard, and I have applied that standard to empirical reality. 
that application gives a result which cannot be replaced by another result. Uh, you know, that painting cannot be at the same time one meter by one meter and two meters by two meters. You know, either of the two measurements is correct. Uh, when I'm in the uh, domain of subjectivity, there is no question of uh, rationality, but there is no question of reasonability. If I go to uh, an art gallery, I look at a painting and I the painting is a complete black canvas. And in front of this completely black canvas, I say, this is actually a representation of love to me. You know, this reminds me of the love of my mother. You know, that's a completely subjective interpretation, which refers the painting to uh, the personal biography of the viewer. And there is no way to question that judgment. And even more if I go in front of the painting and say, this is beautiful. You know, like in contemporary society in which our canons of beauty and, and ugliness are completely deconstructed, you cannot actually question someone who goes to an art gallery and says, oh, I love that painting. You cannot say, no, no, this is not reasonable. Uh, you shouldn't actually say that it's beautiful. You know, this is not rational. You know, like you shouldn't actually say that the painting is beautiful because it's rationally ugly, or it is reasonably uh, uh, reasonable to say that it's actually an ugly painting. You can't. You can't because you are in the domain of pure subjectivity. You know, it's like someone falling in love. You know, my brother falls in love with a with a girl that I completely dislike. And I go to my brother and say, you see, I have a rational theory to prove you that this is the wrong girl, you know, or, or you know, I can reasonably prove to you that this, that it, it's impossible, you know, because that love is totally subjective. Uh, it cannot be disputed in rational terms and reasonable terms. Now you can, of course, uh, say something reasonable about a person, but love is beyond reasonable comprehension. Um, but when I am in the domain of intersubjectivity, what I propose to the others is a reasonable interpretation. A reasonable interpretation means that what I'm saying about this painting can actually be said given the way in which the painting is, given the way in which the painting manifests itself. So, um, if I go to the gallery and there is a completely black canvas in the gallery and I start saying uh, in my interpretation the red color in the painting means blah 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 that is not a reasonable interpretation why because there is no red in the color so that stops any like reasonable uh, uh, discourse you know in order to be reasonable an interpretation must actually refer to some um, a perceptual elements that are potentially at least under the eyes of everyone. The situation is not always so easy, you know, like there was uh, some time ago a famous uh, a, a entertainment on the internet, there was a, um, a dress uh, that had a strange color and people would uh, dispute the nature of this color and they would argue whether this uh, uh, dress was green or was golden or was yellow and so on and so forth. So it's not always easy to uh, uh, come up with a consensus and even about the perception of reality because we have seen that perception is also somehow influenced by uh, semiotic ideologies. At the same time, uh, there is a range within which uh, we consider that what we are saying about a text, about an artifact, is a, a quite reasonable because uh, we can tell that our interpretation actually refers to some elements that are contained in the text. And um, at the same time, when I propose this reasonable interpretation, um, I also uh, propose a theory, advance a theory that is a, a relational theory. So I'm actually saying that there is a relation, which to me is a tangible relation, is a, is a relation that I can actually grasp 
between things that I see in the painting, uh, colors that I see, shapes that I see, and the meaning that they produce in my mind. So this is also, um, in a way, a uh, formulation, the formulation of a hypothesis about causes and effects. Um, I'm saying that the meaning that I have in my mind is actually caused by a certain way in which the text is arranged and presents itself to my senses. So, uh, at the same time, this interpretation is not rational. Why it is not rational? Because although it is based on what I see in the painting and what probably other people can see as well, certain colors, certain shapes, a certain position, and so on, certain positions, and so on and so forth, we are not exactly in the same situation as someone who is taking a meter and is measuring the canvas because we do not actually a precise standard, a precise instrument to come up with a rational hypothesis about what the painting means. You know, this is an old dream of semiotics, but you know, it's a failure. You cannot come up with a rational, um, unique, uh, incontrovertible interpretation of a painting. Uh, you can start from seeing in the painting and point it out and underlining in the painting elements that all the other viewers will be able to see, but at the same time the relations that you posit between these uh, intersubjectively visible elements in the painting and the meaning that they cause, a um, hypothesis about these relations uh, are always a multiplicity. There are always multiple ways to explain how uh, a painting means what it means. Um, you see, our um, consideration of what is intersubjective, what is subjective and what is objective, what is rational, what is reasonable, uh, should be also further specified because uh, uh, the degree of intersubjectivity of our interpretation depends also, let's say, on the script of the interpretation, of the framework, the social cultural framework in which the interpretation takes place. Um, this is an example that um, I take from uh, Dworkin, who has been a great uh, like law scholar, but I uh, repeat this example many times to my students. You know, if Massimo Leone, the professor, goes to uh, the doctor and the doctor says, you know, Professor Massimo Leone, I'm sorry, um, you know, uh, we have taken uh, your uh, uh, blood for some blood tests, your blood has been uh, uh, analyzed and uh, I'm sorry to say that you now have only six months, six months of life ahead. Um, at the same time, you know, the doctor um, this strange doctor would add at the end, uh, but this is only my interpretation, you know, like other doctors who might say different things, you know, like doctors do not say this. Even if there isn't like a complete certainty about data, a doctor would not say, well, you have only six months of life, but this is just my interpretation, you know. So medicine, but think about the law, uh, if you go to court, you are accused of murder and uh, at the end of the trial the judge says well Professor Leone you are sentenced to uh, 30 years in prison uh, because you are being uh, judged and found guilty of murder but at the same time this is just my interpretation because other judges uh, could uh, say different things you know we would never accept that we would never accept that the judge gives us an interpretation which is a, a subjective uh, interpretation, but we would not accept either that the judge gives us an interpretation that is a, a, a mildly intersubjective. Um, we want the judge to give us the best possible interpretation given the evidence that is at the disposal of the trial. We want a doctor to give us the best interpretation that is 
uh, to be um, uh, gathered from medical evidence, blood tests, and so on and so forth. So, of course, that is not necessarily a rational interpretation. Why? Because uh, it is not the case that, uh, for instance, the doctor knows everything about my body or the judge knows everything about what has happened actually on the crime, on the crime scene. So, the best interpretation in the case of medicine, the case of law, is always the best interpretation considered the amount of information that is available. So, it's a limited rationality in a way. But when I am in an art gallery, I also would like to come up with the best interpretation. I also would like to come up with the best possible interpretation that I can intersubjectively offer given the elements that are visible in the painting. And I would also like, when I teach my students, for instance, or when I'm teaching um, theory of literature or art theory to my students in Shanghai or Turin, I would like them to receive from me the best possible interpretation. But can I? Professor of Semiotics, present my interpretations in the same way in which a doctor presents um, his or her diagnosis, or the same way in which a judge presents his or her a verdicts. Um, I cannot do it. Why? Because the um, methodology which is used to come up with reasonable interpretations in law and in medicine are highly qualified. Are highly qualified because these are domains that matter enormously and in which um, nevertheless there is a direct path between empirical evidence and interpretation. But when I'm actually interpreting a painting, uh, the uh, relation between what I see in the painting and what I say about it is much more a lose, it's much looser. Why? Because the painting has not actually been made in order to be verbally interpreted. Uh, the painting has been made in order to be seen, in order for someone to receive this impression of colors, this impression of um, the forms, this impression of shapes and positions, and develop a subjective internal meaning. But when I try to turn the painting into the object of an intersubjective interpretation when I want not only to feel what I um, um, sense and uh, think about a painting, but I want to share these feelings with other people and I want also to demonstrate that my interpretation is actually a, probably a, the most coherent one, then the problems start because I, I must operate a difficult intersemiotic translation. I must put the meaning that the painter, the artist, a, put into colors, shapes, and positions exactly because he or she judged that it was the best way to convey that meaning. I must translate that meaning into a verbal language or a meta language in this case. So, uh, this is to say that uh, uh, when I propose my interpretation uh, about a painting, this is not going to be an objective one, this is not going to be a subjective one, it's going to be an intersubjective interpretation. And at the same time, this intersubjectivity is somehow a weak intersubjectivity because it cannot rely on um, empirical evidence that directly gives rise to its interpretation. Um, I cannot uh, experimentally decode the meaning of a painting, although, let's say, empirical semiotics is progressing and we are developing also many empirical new methods in order to, for instance, study what happens to my eyes, to my gaze, when I see a certain painting, you know, we can use now some techniques of eye tracking in order to understand how the majority of people move their eyes when they are in front of a certain painting. What is it that they look at first, or what is it that they look at last, and so on and so forth. So, there is another um, meaning, though, which is uh, important in the concept of reasonability, 
When I say that interpretation is reasonable, I do so not only in order to distinguish it from a rational interpretation, but also uh, to underline the fact that this interpretation is a proposal, can be reasoned. You know, it's uh, um, exactly the same difference between, let's say, drinkable water and drank water. You know, saying that uh, a certain amount of water is drinkable doesn't mean that uh, this water is actually being uh, drunk by someone. Uh, it means that this uh, water is uh, apt, is ready to be drank if someone is thirsty. Um, so, when I'm proposing a reasonable interpretation, I'm doing the same. I'm saying that uh, what I find in this painting is like drinkable water. So I can offer this drinkable water to other people, other people can um, themselves uh, drink it. So they can accept my interpretive proposal, but they can do something personal with it. They can uh, complement my interpretation. They can complement my interpretation, they can complement it in especially if we are on the same page, if we are playing the same, um, let's say, linguistic game, but especially if we are playing the same a semiotic game. And this game uh, relies on the acceptance of certain rules. You see, if I go to my art gallery and I look at the painting, but uh, I start interpreting this painting without considering the value of the frame. So, without making any difference between what is inside the frame and what is outside of it, well, my interpretation will not be comparable and will not be reasonable for someone who, uh, who endorses, adopts and embraces the convention according to which what I, what I actually should look at when I look at a painting is what is within the frame, not what is outside of it. So, this is a rule that uh, relies on a certain format, a certain genre, some rules of genre, and also some elements that uh, semiotics called, calls paratextual. Paratextual signs or paratextual uh, messages are all those signs, all those messages that tell me how I should approach a text, not how I should interpret it. That's, that's a different uh, story. Uh, paratextual messages or signs, they simply tell me how I should look at a painting, how I should read a novel. You know, for instance, um, if we read the same novel uh, together, and then we start to uh, try to come up with a common interpretation, uh, but then at some stage we realize that we are not sharing the same frame, that we are not sharing the same rules of the game. You know, realize for instance that for some of you it is not necessary to read the entire novel before coming up with an interpretation. Because some of you maybe believe that reading, let's say, half of the novel is enough to come up with an interpretation. Then we are not on the same page, we are not playing the same game. Uh, we are actually uh, approaching this game with different standards, with different rules. Again, we are like you know, two players in the same sport field, one playing soccer, the other one playing handball. You know? like apparently, we are doing the same thing, but actually we are doing a completely different thing, and our interpretations are not comparable. So, reasonability implies that there is an intersubjectively accepted framework within which a certain text is interpreted and within which uh, certain relations of causes and effects are uh, posited between the empirical appearance uh, and agency of a text and the meaning that this uh, text uh, gives rise to um, in uh, a beholder's minds. So, uh, the problem of critical semiotics, the problem of cultural semiotics, but also the problem of semiotics uh, to core, general semiotics, is to uh, uh, determine what these rules are. 
determine what are the best conditions given which uh, we can then proceed intersubjectively uh, toward the definition of the meaning of a text. Because these rules actually exist in law, for instance. If you study to become a lawyer in, in uh, Italy or you study to become a lawyer in the United States or in France, you're going to spend many years acquiring a specific detailed knowledge about the rules that must be abided by by anyone, lawyers, judges, prosecutors, who want to participate to the semiotic game of a trial. The same goes for doctors. Doctors spend many years trying to acquire the rules of the game according to which they'll gather evidence personally or through machines and then try to come up with a diagnosis. But uh, this kind of explicit codified uh, rules do not actually exist in humanities. Um, you know, there are some scholars and semioticians um, thinking about the so-called uh, French the Paris School, so Alger Bess, Julien Grimas, and his Paris Seminar, they tried at certain stage to come up with very codified rules and a very codified methodology to intersubjectively interpret a text, a literary text. You know, if you uh, read one of the um, more um, most didactic uh, um, uh, books uh, written by Grimas, uh, his analysis of uh, the short story Deux Amis to France by Maupassant. You know, that book is a sort of a handbook of interpretation of how you should segment a text, how you should start interpreting the text, to which words you should pay attention to in order to. But um, it was clear very soon that he was. Um, very difficult, if not impossible, to transport that method which had actually worked for um, interpreting that French novel into other domains. And it was evident, especially when people started to take this method and apply this method to um, other novels that were nevertheless a a belonging to very distant cultures. So can I, something that I always discuss with my Chinese colleagues, can I actually use Western semiotics or Western art theory uh, so as to interpret a classical Chinese poetry or to interpret a, a traditional a Chinese landscape painting? Well, I can of course come up with interesting interpretations, but at the same time uh, these frameworks, these methods, um, these um, modalities, these rules of interpretation are highly dependent on the text interpreting which they have been actually formulated. This is not the case for, for medicine, you see. Uh, I would have no problem whatsoever in having my blood tested uh, in a Chinese hospital, you know, sometimes when I was in Shanghai, I had some little health problems. I went to a Chinese hospital and they uh, took care of my health problems uh, without any complication. Uh, you see, of course, there is a cultural inflection also on disease, on uh, the ways in which certain cultures uh, give more or less importance to symptoms, uh, to certain parts of the body. This is something that Simona Stano actually works on as well because she's a specialist on food but she's uh, working more and more on the uh, semiotics of the body as a general field and also in um, the concept of health and how semiotics is also important in the practice of medicine but nevertheless you see the difference between the way the body is approached by a, a, a doctor in China and um, the way in which the body is approached by a doctor in uh, um, Italy uh, is not very different if both doctors have been trained according to the same medical school, let's say the Western medical school or on the contrary the Chinese traditional medicine. 
So the answers they will come up with they resemble each other a lot. So um, this is not the case, of course, when uh, a semiotician, a Western semiotician like me, is uh, invited by a Chinese colleague to give an interpretation about a, a landscape painting uh, in, in China. Uh, my approach to the painting, my approach to the idea of landscape, uh, my um, modality, my own modality of attributing meaning to shapes, to colors, my, even my, uh, my idea of what a painting is in society or what an image is in society um, might be radically different from uh, the idea of a painting, the idea of a landscape, the idea of a landscape painting that a Chinese colleague might have. So, doesn't mean that in these cases our interpretations are uh, not comparable. Doesn't mean that we should give up uh, the idea of reasonability when we are in humanities. Doesn't mean that uh, uh, there is no possible intersubjectivity, especially if we uh, pass from, let's say, the analysis of a local culture and its local products to a comparative dimension in which scholars from different cultural backgrounds actually meet in order to talk about the meaning of novels, the meaning of paintings, the meaning of architecture. This is not the case. I mean, uh, affirming that Humanities cannot rely on a solid, stable, intersubjective framework and set of rules in order to interpret texts does not mean that we should go back to complete anarchy in interpretation, that we should endorse or embrace the deconstructionist the idea that uh, what we do with texts is individually play with them without the possibility of any social game of interpretation. Now, this is the position, typical position of a, a deconstructionism uh, inspired by the philosophy of Jacques Derrida, but then developed, especially in the United States, but not only, as a negation of any possibility of reasonable intersubjective interpretation. You know, to this extreme, to the extreme of saying, okay, not only there is no rationality in interpretation in humanities, but there is no reasonability either, there is no intersubjectivity either. We are all alone, we are all individuals in front of a painting, and moreover, each time that we are in front of it, we are different individuals with different interpretations, and no method is available to value some of these interpretations more than others. Well, between these two extremes, the extreme of, let's say, dreaming of an objective, rational interpretation of a painting and the um, uh, giving away, give, giving up of any um, idea of intersubjectivity, there is a third way, which is the third way that was explored um, during decades and uh, through the writings of many books, uh, by Umberto Eco, the founding father of um, uh, Italian semiotics, one of the most important uh, scholars in the history of semiotics. And Umberto Eco uh, stressed um, through many books the importance of a, the concept of interpretation. He stressed also the idea that interpretations actually has some limits must have some limits, and these limits concern the fundamental dialectics between interpretation on the one hand and usage on the other hand. So, when I'm a, interpreting a text uh, without any uh, concern for its intersubjectivity, for the intersubjectivity of my interpretation, I'm actually coming up with a sort of conspiracy theory. That is, that is something that Umberto Eco also studied and he wrote novels about. Um, so, in, when I interpret social reality without uh, um, determining, imposing any limits to my interpretation, 
what I come up with in many circumstances is sort of a delirium in which I um, create a spot in reality, uh, relations of causes and effects that are actually not there, that uh, are not a, a emerging from empirical evidence, that only I, with my imagination, are um, seeing uh, in reality. So, uh, when I'm using a text, I'm actually creating a sort of a conspiracy theory about the meaning of the text. But when I interpret it, I should somehow exert an effort of self-constraint. I should interpret the text in a way that can somehow be also not accepted, but at least a, a valued and considered by others, uh, taking into account the empirical dimension of the text, what in the text can be seen. So, it is now time to take another little break. Uh, we'll uh, uh, have a break at the hour and we'll uh, um, start uh, our um, class again uh, at 10 past. But I would like to use these uh, last minutes to introduce uh, Professor Simona Stano. Professor Simona Stano is a very distinguished scholar uh, who has been uh, uh, working at many universities. Uh, um, she's active now predominantly at the University of Turin, but uh, she has been working also at New York University, Toronto University, and now uh, she's going to be working also in China regularly uh, because uh, uh, she's in contact uh, with uh, one of the most important uh, uh, groups for semiotics in, in China, which is the group of the uh, University of Sichuan uh, in Chengdu. So, uh, Professor Stano came already to China on several occasions to give talks, and uh, she's reputed in Italy and internationally for her knowledge of cultural semiotics applied uh, specifically uh, to food, but also more and more to more general and philosophical engaging uh, concepts like the body or um, even the idea of ideologies. She has um, published extensively uh, a very important book about the translation of Japanese food in Italian food culture. And she's now working on several projects, including an important European uh, project called Confection. And um, it's going to be a pleasure um, listening to her, and uh, I thank her very much for her participation in, in the seminar. We're now going to have like a short break, and uh, let's say 11 12 minutes break, and uh, at exactly uh, past 10, uh, we're going to resume with Professor Simon Stan. Thank you very much and see you in like 11, 12 minutes maximum. Bye.